All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are about to begin tonight's event. Welcome, uh, you can settle in now, we're gonna get started. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the Black Mountain Institute operates from the city of Las Vegas, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Southern Paiute people. Thank you everyone, uh, attendees and fellows for joining us for tonight's uh, celebration of both this season's crop of visiting writers and also the 20th anniversary of Vegas's City of Asylum program. My name is Drew Cohen and I will be your host this evening. I'm not with Black Mountain Institute. I am the co-owner of the Writer's Block here in downtown Vegas. We are an independent bookstore and we partner with uh, with Black Mountain Institute on a number of their events, and uh, I'm just delighted to be here. Um, I also need to mention that I have the distinct privilege of living amongst almost all of these writers. We're all neighbors in the same building. Um, so I get to observe them at their most banal moments when they're taking out the garbage or getting their Uber Eats deliveries. And so this is very special for me because I finally get to, uh, to see them in their element and hear all the things they've been working on. So I'm personally, very excited for that. Um, some of you, most of you, I imagine, are familiar with Black Mountain Institute, but some of you may be joining us for the first time. And so for your benefit, I will explain what Black Mountain Institute is. Uh, Black Mountain Institute is here in Las Vegas on the campus of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Its aim is to bring writers and the literary imagination into the heart of public life. They do this by way of their year round events like this one through fellowships where the writers will typically come to Vegas to work on their project for the, a, a semester or longer and through student enrichment opportunities and through innovative media like the Believer Magazine, Witness Magazine and Black Mountain Radio. Tonight is a special occasion also because it is the 20th anniversary of Black Mountain Institute's City of Asylum program, which not many people know, I have to admit, I didn't know until recently, uh, was the first program of its kind in the United States and actually predates Black Mountain Institute um, and was, is, was uh, uh, crucial in, in, in Black Mountain Institute coming into existence. Um, the City of Asylum program provides safe haven to writers who have been persecuted for their literary work. Um, it gives them stipend, living quarters, um, institutional support so that they may live and write freely without censorship, risk of imprisonment, or threats against their lives. So just a quick virtual uh, cheers to the City of Asylum program uh, and its 20 year uh, anniversary. All right, so a, a few notes before we kick things off. The Writer's Block, uh, my bookstore, is going to be offering a Black Mountain Institute bundle for the rest of the year. It will include five books signed by tonight's readers and it is discounted. It's like a, at least $10 less than buying them individually. Um, there is a link in the chat where you can purchase that bundle online. We're gonna be uh, bundling those uh, and shipping them uh, in the next week or so, and we will be restocking them through the end of the year. So I encourage you to check that out. And you're also welcome to purchase any of the fellows books individually on our website. They are all discounted uh, through the year. All right, uh, there are two events coming up with Black Mountain Institute that I'd like to make you aware of. On Monday, November 15th at 5 p.m., also on Zoom, Mary South, who you are about to meet, is hosting fiction writers Chaya Bhuvashnewar, Bud Smith, and Douglas Stewart as they read from their work and discuss what it's like to be writers with day jobs outside of the literary and publishing scene. So I think it's like a great concept for an event. And I, I think a lot of people are going to be interested in that. So definitely check that out. It's Monday, November 15th at 5 p.m. also on Zoom. And then on Tuesday, November 30th, also at 5 p.m., you can join us for a screening of the introductory episode of Bar for Bar After Party. It's a limited series produced by Shireen Fellow, Felita Hicks, who you're also going to meet in a moment, and their collaborators. It is a scripted oral history told with spoken word and music that reimagines the outcomes of police in, uh, interactions and posits a future 
where government agencies like the police don't exist. So that is Tuesday, November 30th at 5 p.m. And there's a link to it in the chat as well. Two more brief notes and then we'll get started. There will be a Q&A time permitting at the end of this event. You can click the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom interface and type your questions. Um, please feel free to ask uh, uh, questions to any or all the panelists, and you can also upvote other people's questions um, if you're really if you're keen on seeing those answered. So you can do one of those two things. And then, lastly, if you don't already subscribe to Black Mountain Institute's newsletter. Uh, do so now. Uh, it is the best way to keep up to date on their upcoming events and other opportunities. And the link for that will also be in the chat in a moment. It is uh, blackmountaininstitute.org slash live hyphen experiences. It's right there in the chat. All right, okay, all the housekeeping is out of the way and we can get started. Um, so I am going to welcome our first writer this evening to the program. Jorge Olivia, Ol Olivera Castillo. Um, Jorge, you're welcome to turn on your camera and join us. Um, Jorge is not actually one of the fellows living in the building, sadly. So I don't get to snoop on him too much, um, but he does live a few blocks away. <laughs> um, hello, Jorge, and welcome on. Um, Jorge Olivera, oh, I can't talk already. This is horrible. Jorge Olivera Castillo is a poet, writer, television editor, journalist and songwriter, and he is one of tonight's City of Asylum fellows. For more than 25 years, Olivera Castillo worked as an independent journalist before being fired from the Cuban Institute of Radio and Television due to his ideas and activities in, in support of freedom of speech. He became a political prisoner because of his journalistic work and was incarcerated for almost two years, including nine months of solitary confinement. Olivera Castillo has published six books of poetry and two short story collections. His literary works have been translated into several languages, including English, Italian, Czech, and Polish. At present, Olivera Castillo is writing his third collection of short stories based on his experiences as a soldier in the African jungle during the Angolan Civil War. He has also completed a new collection of poetry and its publication is forthcoming. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jorge Oliveira Castillo. Thank you, you uh, for your intro introduce. Uh, you, can, you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Jorge, we can hear you. Yeah, um, um, before I started, I would like to congratulate to all people who work of, on Black Mountain Institute, Believer Magazine, and also the creators of City of Asylum. Thank you, everybody, for these very important projects, which have been a great opportunity to several writers and artists around the world. Your work and those who preceded deserve being highlights for its impact on life who have been here. Once more again, thank you and keep going. Now I am going to read some of my poems in Spanish and you will be to able to read them off the screen simultaneously. Thank you. The first point is immersion. Yo era una pequeña isla en el océano, poblada, poblada por el canto de las golondrinas y el alegre susurro de los bosques. Ahora soy un continente arrendado por el polvo, encadenado a las barandas del silencio y amigo íntimo de las noches más oscuras. Perdonen la carga de cada palabra que brota de mi garganta. Mientras me hundo lentamente bajo las olas que se elevan, donde termina la soledad y comienza el olvido. Second, peligro de extinción. Ha pasado mucho tiempo sin lágrimas ni lluvias en estas regiones del desencanto. 
solo piedras y rostros endurecidos y un montón de arena que el sol lame cuando asoma su rostro por las persianas del amanecer. No sabemos por qué nos han confiscado los espejos y las mantas gastadas de nuestras ilusiones. ¿Será una forma de humanizar la muerte? Lo cierto es que seguimos aquí en el vórtice de la aridez, con la mirada fija en todos los mensajes que el orador despacha a Granel, sin fuerzas para llorar y a la espera de la tormenta. Third, este poema, este poema con su dosis de pólvora y espadas de doble filo, está escrito para quebrar la mano que me empuja hacia un lugar oscuro y desierto. Este poema que aflora entre el brillo de las perlas está escrito para llegar a la cima de cualquiera de mis sueños y mostrarle al mundo que la alegría no ha muerto. Este poema que es también una flor que huele a ti desde sus primeros versos hasta el punto que marca el inicio de un nuevo asombro. Hombre armado, lo que parece ser un objeto de museo encerrado en mi puño es una pistola real. Estoy cerca y a la vez lejos de mi objetivo, el brazo en línea recta, la mirada empañada por las dudas de pasar una noche más sin tus palabras corriendo hacia alguna de las siete puertas de mi refugio tras las detonaciones. The last Salida. En uno de los laberintos de piedra que recorro todos los días, con pasos de hombre herido, veo el tenue brote de las flores al borde del camino. Una imagen aún distante, pero atrapada en mis ojos con un nudo de tres dobleces. A medida que avanza, que avanzo, los pétalos crecen con la luz galopando sobre, su super, su, sobre sus, sus superficies. Tropiezo, pero logro recuperar el ritmo de mis pasos. Caigo de bruces y me levanto como un resorte. Nada detendrá mi marcha hacia lo que parece ser. Nada detendrá mi marcha triunfal hacia lo que parece ser una puerta entreabierta. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jorge. That was wonderful um, and a totally ingenious way to present those poems. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. If anyone has any questions for Jorge, um, please open that Q&A window and feel free um, to submit your question. And uh, I'm going to now move on to the next writer this evening, um, who is my neighbor directly across from me. I can, we, we, we share a patio. And uh, so our next reader is Mary South, the fiction writer. Um, Mary, you can come on if you'd like. Um, I've gotten to know Mary a little bit and her wonderful partner, Andrew, and their charming, grizzled, gray pug, Daisy. Um, Mary is the author of You Will Never Be Forgotten, which was a finalist for the Penn Bingham Prize for a debut story collection and long listed for the story prize. Her fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, American Short Fiction, Conjunctions, Noon, Guernica, and elsewhere. She has received support from VCC, sorry, V, yeah, two Cs, VCCA, the Breadloaf Writers Conference and the Sawini Writers Conference. A graduate of the MFA program at Columbia University, she lives in New York and is at work on a novel about healthcare class and late capitalist metamorphosis for Farr, Strauss, and Garreau. I'm um, really excited to hear what Mary is working on right now. Uh, everyone, welcome Mary South. Thank you so much, Drew, for that wonderful introduction. And, uh, you know, it's lovely to pass you by in the stairways and the passageways here at the Lucy. Um, and I'm just honored to be here as a BMI fellow. Um, so tonight I'm gonna to read from the opening of my novel in progress. It follows a nurse who tends to women turning into household objects at a hospice for the ultra wealthy. Whenever one of my patients asked 
what object I would hope to turn into if I had to confront that eventuality myself. I always answered, a desk. I liked the idea of getting scattered with important papers, I explained, with keys and spare change and cast off jewelry, perhaps elegantly damaged by stray pen marks and coffee cup rings. A desk seemed the best of all belongings at displaying the personality of its owner. In acknowledgement, my patient usually offered a dreamy hmm or a nod. Then I resumed the activity paused for this question, applying numbing paste to the inflamed tissue around her ports and knobs and valves, or escorting her to the surgeon for a mechanical debridement. But a desk isn't really what I hoped to turn into. I was skilled at the palliative lie, since I found the truth is rarely comforting, or it takes too long to appreciate how it is comforting. The veneer of intimacy will do just as well. Secretly, I believed I would be most at peace as a mirror, tall as I am now, or slightly taller, ordinary in every aspect with the exception of texture, my glass rem remaining supple as skin. As a mirror, I could hide from the world by reflecting it exactly. That was a quality sought after in the nurses, a pleasing ordinariness. The nurse was supposed to have a face you could stare at for hours, but couldn't quite remember when she was out of sight. Such a face, standard as a clock face, blank like a place setting, made it easier to assume whatever role was needed for her in the moment, whether that was the role of nurse or that of secretary or therapist or chaplain, since we were required to be more than nurses. We not only memorized a woman's allergies and prescriptions, her menstrual cycles and hereditary tumors, her history, but also her favorite scents, her favorite designers, her entire inventory of favorites. We emptied the colostomy bags of women whose intestines had been irreparably tangled with wires. We drafted correspondence on behalf of charitable foundations. We dripped poison into veins to combat the spread of metastatic plastic. We listened to the accounts of disappointments, losses, and traumas, counseled a woman to forgive those who had wronged her and to forgive herself. And we simply kept company at the end, were present as a woman seized, transforming into her final artificial shape. I had heard about the hospice before I was contracted for a position, but when the topic insisted in coming up in conversation, my attention would lapse. It wasn't somewhere you could apply for a job. Nurses were recruited, not hired, from luxury wellness spas or exclusive concierge medicine centers with their imported percale sheets, their Arctic char, or a nurse knew someone who knew someone, but as I had neither a referral nor a pedigree so impressive that I could be a potential candidate for hire, I never envisioned myself among the staff and didn't find it as fascinating as so many did. Then, in the middle of what had been a calmer night shift monitoring a collision victim getting weaned off the ventilator, I was assigned a young woman in septic shock. She had arrived at the emergency room with a typical sort of excruciating pain in the left side of her abdomen that radiated into her shoulder. Doctors suspected a ruptured spleen and an ultrasound confirmed this, but it also showed something else, something oblong and hard that flared into what looked like diabolical wings. When they opened her up and removed the item, along with her unsalvageable spleen, a resident identified what it was, the curved blades and hollow plastic attachment that slotted into a blender. In post-op, the symptoms of critical infection began her confusion about where she was and why, her shivering even though she had a fever, the precipitous drop in blood pressure, thus ushering her into my intensive care unit. Soon thereafter, everyone on duty found out about the blender. What if she had switched on prior to the operation? Her organs would have been whipped into a puree or an artery shredded, resulting in her bleeding out instantaneously. Maybe that would have been kindest, our evening charge nurse absently commented. Another nurse absently replied that it was a shame when a girl with so much ahead of her was diagnosed. She was practically a teenager still and very pretty. There was a joke about absconding with her attachment and testing it out at home to make a delicious smoothie or salsa picante. I told myself not to say anything, not a friendly reminder about the dangers of schadenfreude, not a sarcastic remark that household appliances were often better behaved than their human hosts and those who look after them. 
I had witnessed what can happen when a nurse was deemed a problem, how she was mocked or reprimanded for mistakes that weren't her fault, relegated the worst cases or too many cases or too many worst cases, or how she was outright abandoned, finding herself inconveniently on her own when she needed assistance with a patient who was crashing. Instead, I treated this young woman with drugs and fluids and extra scrutiny. The parents had flown in and I treated them too, with cups of water, tissues, snacks from the vending machine. Of course, I didn't have to do this, but the distraught state of the mother bothered me, despite my training, the distraught mothers I'd previously encountered. My stomach sympathetically clenched, and then, I imagined, began to solidify into a tight cylinder of guilt as she moved a chair to the edge of a bed, rested her forehead in the steeple her daughter's fate, feet made under the covers, and wept. As she kept incanting, it's my fault, it's my fault. It's not your fault, I said, though I wasn't convinced of that myself. But those blades, she continued, I pushed her, pushed and pushed and pushed. I was so focused on achievement. Again, I told myself not to say anything, not to point out that it must be a relief to place the blame for the spontaneous growth of this attachment on bad behavior that could be forgiven as inherently good comically mirthless perfectionism or suffocating adoration, as opposed to unequivocally bad behavior. I'm more worried about the sepsis, I replied. Then, concerned that was an insensitive slip, I added, I've known women who have lived for a while with the condition. It doesn't have to be the immediately dire prognosis you fear it is. I'll stop there, thank you. Oof, oh my gosh. Thank you, Mary. I'm really excited to read this novel when it's done. I'm uh, really looking forward to, uh, to seeing the complete thing. Thank you so much for sharing from your, your work in progress. And I'll see you around the, the facility. <laughs> All right, well, next up, we have a very dear friend of mine and next door neighbor, um, Amanda Fortini, who's welcome to, to, to come uh, onto the stage. Hi, Amanda. Um, Amanda um, has the distinction of living right next door to me, which means that she can hear when my teenage daughter is blasting like her horrible EDM music um, during summer vacation and, and whatnot. So thanks Amanda for putting up with it. Uh, uh, you're a good neighbor um, and an amazing nonfiction writer. <laughs> so Amanda uh, has written for the New York Times, the New Yorker, the New Republic, the Paris Review, New York, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Wired, Slate, and Salon, among other publications. She has previously worked as an editor at Mirabella, the New York Review of Books, and Slate, and has been the William Kittridge Visiting Professor at the University of Montana. Her essays have been widely anthologized, including in Best American Political Writing and Best of Slate, and then I believe the year, last year's Best Travel Writing, um, and she was nominated for James Beard Foundation Journalism Award. After several semesters as a lecturer in journalism here in Vegas at UNLV's Greenspun College for Urban Affairs, Fortini contributed articles and essays on Las Vegas, including several for The New Yorker and an acclaimed cover story for California Sunday. Uh, please welcome the fantastic Amanda Fortini. Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, okay, good. Um, Drew, uh, thank you for that lovely introduction and I don't mind listening to um, Paige's karaoke. It's no, it's no problem. Um, so this piece that I'm gonna read for you is um, a piece that was actually published in February, 2020. So um, as you can imagine, it had a lot of readers. <laughs> um, Roxanne, Roxanne Gay published it in Gay Magazine and I wanted to read it because the pandemic has been somewhat challenging for me, um, maybe for some of you too, work-wise, especially at the beginning, because I report, you know, I'm a, a lot of my nonfiction requires that I go out, I meet people, you know, I tell other people's stories basically. So that has presented certain challenges logistically, ethically, you know, just wearing masks and all of it. So, um, so I start, I realized that like, in order to sort of connect with my work, I had to start sort of tunneling back into myself, into my childhood, into my memories, into my own, you know, interiority and, or that was my solution anyway. And, um, cause I'm always very outward focused on, on, on other people. And um, so I've been revisiting the terrain of this essay that I'm gonna read. I'm just gonna read a little part of it. 
um, which is about my adolescence, but that material is just a little too uncooked. So um, I'm going to read this one, which is a very different mode than I usually write in. So maybe some of you will be curious to hear it. Um, like I said, this is a this is an essay about my um, adolescence, and um, some people have emailed me and said it's about you know girlhood and trauma too. Um, so I don't know. I guess it is. But uh, I think of it as just sort of a memoir of my adolescence. Summer. Oh, it, actually, the, the piece is called 1991-1992, Four Seasons in Memory. And it goes through the seasons. Summer. In the summer, when you were a teenager, you'd climb out your bedroom window. It went like this. Someone, almost always a boy, would come to the window, tap, tap, tap. You'd sit up from the bed where you waited fully clothed under your blue and green floral Laura Ashley bedspread and arrange the pillows into a five foot six lump that vaguely resembled a sleeping person, her body and face covered by blankets. Using your arms, which were strong from gymnastics, you'd boost yourself up on the windowsill, bringing one foot, then the other, to meet it. A few feet below, an air conditioning box awaited you. You'd slide down it, butt against windowsill, and from there it was a quick jump to the grass, glossy and wet from the sprinkler, followed by a jog of 100 feet or so to the curb. You prayed your gossipy religious neighbors couldn't see you as you hustled yourself to the idling car. The minutes, sometimes hours you spent waiting for the arrival of whichever boy you momentarily liked, your heart pinballing around in your rib cage were terrifying, exhilarating. You felt like you might vomit, but the rush you got from defying your mother and her overly strict rules, you lived in an evangelical town and were not evangelical. She was proving a point, it was so bracing that the fear was worth it. You didn't yet know the dark paths your rebellious ways would take you down, and you wouldn't for years. Right then, in gray, staid, boring, fundamentalist suburban Illinois, where the judgment of your neighbors, teachers, and friends always rumbled like a looming thunderstorm, you just loved feeling wild and free. You shared a room with your sister, who was only 13 months younger than you were, and from her you demanded stillness, silence, unstinting loyalty. She was as anxious as you were that your mom would wake up and catch you mid-flight. You lived in a tiny ranch house, one level, your bedroom just down the hall from your mother's, so close that you could hear her dry little cough, the telltale sign that she was stirring from the oceanic depths of sleep. If she merely cleared her throat, your heart would belly flop. This was in the days before cell phones, so you couldn't text or call to abort the mission. Once you committed, you were going with the boy who was coming to fetch you or you were getting caught. You never did though. In this way, you hung out with boys late into the night and in, in the dark cramped backseat of somebody's back, somebody's car, in motel rooms rented with fake IDs, in the dank base basements of home where parents were gone and no one thought to ask where. In this way, you find yourself at 2 a.m. on a muggy early August night, sitting on a wooden bench that faces a tiny man-made lake in a public park near your home with a boy named Tony, who is three years older than you are, 18 to your 15, and known for sleeping with his girlfriends. You are a virgin. Sex is still scary to you, mysterious. You don't remember now what he said to you that night, only that one moment you are virtual strangers biding time with each other so that your friends, who are a newly formed couple, can make out in a cop's of nearby trees, their leaves silvery in the late summer moonlight. And the next moment his hand is touching your wrist in a way that leaves your entire body coursing with electricity. His mouth is on yours, his tongue meets yours, his hand moves up your shirt, over your thin cotton bra, under it. You have spent many nights in public parks leaning against a cold metal jungle gym as some nervous boy small talked his way to a chaste dry lipped kiss. This is different. Tony is in control, his arms muscular and confident, steering the situation like he does the <clears throat> bright red sports car he drives at top speed into the parking lot at school. What happened, your friend who was staying overnight at your house asks, once you've safely re-entered your bedroom and dismembered the fake pillow bodies you created, one for her on the floor. You don't know. You, you tell her you're not sure. You honestly can't say. You were just sitting on that bench listening to cicadas buzz and fumbling for words and then some primal part of you that you didn't know existed was awakened. You only see Tony once more that summer. You watch, you watch a movie in his parents' basement. His hands roam further still. At school that fall when those August nights feel like unreal interludes existing outside of space and time, he'll tell everyone you let him touch you. In the fall, not fall. In the fall, when you were a teenager, you quit bothering with the window. You'd return home by curfew, a humiliatingly, and to your mind, unjustly early 10 p.m., and tiptoe into your mother's bedroom where you'd find her asleep. 
She had chronic bronchitis in those years and a two hour commute to and from work each day and always seemed to be sleeping. I'm home, you'd tell her. You'd wait five, 10 minutes to make sure she wasn't going to wake up and check on you. Then you'd turn around and walk back out the front door. You weren't going anywhere. You had nowhere to go. Football games and basketball games, yes, but those finished by nine. They were sometimes followed by school dances or house parties when someone's parents were out of town, but mostly you and your friends drove a circuit that you'd nicknamed the Bermuda Triangle, McDonald's to 7-Eleven to Denny's and back again. You'd loiter in inside each place long enough for the manager to threaten to kick you out, kick out the whole lot of you, maybe buy fries or a Coke or a plate of eggs with a handful of pocket change collected from the group, and then you'd begin the entire cycle again. Occasionally, you'd mix things up and drive to Taco Bell. On early fall nights when it was still warm, you'd drive to a glorified patch of trees the county speciously called a forest preserve and sip beer like it was lukewarm and sip beer that was lukewarm and bitter from sitting too long in someone's car. It was only a matter of time before the police came, hollering, move on people and you'd better not be underage and drinking. The police were forever showing up. The specter of them was ever present like a skin condition always threatening to erupt. You lived in fear of them. If you got arrested, you might not get into college and that you knew was your only way out. One evening in a wooded area just off the highway, a group of you sit talking and drinking wine coolers, the only ambient noise, the river of cars flowing past. A police car pulls into the thicket without turning on its headlights. The officer clearly means to creep up on you, but the lack of light also renders him unable to see you. You hear the low growl of the engine, the sticks and brambles crackling under its tires, and you scatter like small woodland creatures, hiding behind trees and bushes. The cop turns on his headlights. Two boys are illuminated by the bright twin coronas of light. He pushes the first one, a blonde kid named Ryan. All the boys at that time are named Ryan. Against his car, face first. The kid meets the door with an audible thud. From where you are hiding, crouched in the weedy dirt behind the trunk of an elm tree, you can't see anything, but you hear this and you begin to shiver, your body quietly convulsing from fright. So it goes on to winter and spring, but I'm going to end there because I don't want to take up too much more time. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Amanda. And I included a link to the complete piece. It's really lovely. Um, I suggest you all check it out. It's, it's uh, absolutely wonderful. One of my favorite things published during the pandemic. Um, Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to bring on our next writer in a moment, um, Felita Hicks. Um, Felita, please, uh, you can come on the screen when you have a moment. Um, Felita is also a neighbor of mine. However, they live in the apartment that's diagonally across from me. So it has this mysterious remote quality. Every fellow who, who stays in that apartment is like, it's there's this enigmatic <laughs> dimension to it. We have a really nice patio. Um, so welcome, welcome Felita. Um, Felita Hicks is the author of Hood Witch, a finalist for the 2020 Lambda Literary Award for bisexual poetry, among other accolades. I should add, it has the accolade of just selling a bajillion copies at our store. Um, we just put it out, and it's it's been a huge seller. So anyway, just with no with no word from us, just people picking it up. Um, the true test. Felita um, is the former editor in chief of Borderlands, Texas Poetry Review, and the 2021 Poet in Residence of Civil Rights Corps. Their work has been published in American Poetry Review, Long Reads, Poetry, Slate, Texas Observer, Yale Review, and others. They have an MFA from Sierra Nevada University, and they have received fellowships and residencies from Tin House, Lambda Literary, Jack Jones Literary Arts, Broadway Advocacy Coalition, The Dots Between, and The Right of Return USA. Everyone, welcome Thalita Hicks. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, I wish I could spend more time in writer's block. I haven't had a chance to just spend time there. I've been working with my family a lot um, since I got here, but uh, I've chosen two poems that I've written while I was here. So these are brand new poems. Uh, and these poems are a work in progress. Uh, I'm working on a collection currently entitled uh, Storm of Butterflies. And so, yeah, let's just get into the first poem. The first poem is called Critical Race Theory. I will survive the sordid dictations of their inept accountant, an incontinent man, 
gorged on a buffet of capital cities, many in which I now hemorrhage. I will survive. The city's teeming with the distorted perspectives of the recently disenfranchised, still convulsing under the unbleached blankets of our narcissistic government's democracy. I will survive. The Lily White House, obsessed with photos of its own private disappointments. I will survive. The hollow promise of liberation, dressed as the Roman letters of someone else's constitution, a constitution still sucking on the bloody lip of a warrant ground up list, wet with the ink of my melting face. I will survive. The gale of silence that blew through my summer of righteous indignation, a billowing cloud of fury that kept me from the glory of being both alive and recognized. I will survive. The whitewashed well wishes and prayers of the conservative moderates with their foam expressos, with their love for their organic groceries, with their war colored banks in their arms, welcomed home like sailors. I will survive for myself. But in continuum exist the unmistaken request for the nakedness of our collective terror, which is still unlisted in the database of human discomfort. I will survive a history recently uprooted and ready for propagation, a history thrown into the kindling, reconfigured as I am now as disposable, just as good for fuel as any poor fool's hours, I will survive. The tinkering of a disillusioned council, obsessed with the moral precision, but lacking in radical humility, still fighting for control over the spiritual particulars of my technicolor flesh, I will survive and not just in the mutilated context of any one era. Despite the shade, the noise of my holistic love will be known. Once a mechanical abuse of my orgasm, it is now a blessed return to the sacred study of a carnal knowledge, a power as old as self-possession, liberation, in the shape of pleasure. Better I say than their infatuation with my soft commerce hasn't managed to and won't Kill me yet. And so um, this next poem is a poem that I wrote for Janiqua Charles. Janiqua Charles was detained in June of 2020 and she went viral um, because in a, during the detainment, she started screaming, uh, you gonna lose your job today. And what's important about this is the monitoring of um, Black people's movements during everyday circumstances. She was standing outside of a club. She was trying to get her purse from inside the club. It escalated. And the only reason why she was let go is because people were filming and they could not give a reason for why they had put her in handcuffs. And so this poem is for her. Officer, I chew bullets like they tobacco. You gonna lose your job today. What about my childhood says, anvil, anvil, here is how I die. With a tongue turned to gravel, my legs cut out from under me. You could never kill me with those little ass hammers when everything about me screams famine. I'll die of hunger before I die of your greed. You could never get me to take into my dirty machine your thin, itty bitty, weak ass assassins are gulped down your shiny, tiny cock. I ain't sorry, sir. I said what I said. Ask old girl from down over there in Louisville. She'll tell you. You can bleed us all you like, but as long as any one of us got air, we gonna be in somebody's back, gyrating slow. That's just how memories work. Minor inheritances born into new bodies. Sir, I have always been a burden of ours. Ask my mama. It's going to take centuries of bloodletting to let me die. Like I said, no, it won't be easy to lay me down. Officer, I am the flesh dense memory of my mama's icker, an expanse of our mutilated histories. I know what she knows, and she knows what I had hoped my girls wouldn't have to know that bleeding comes easily for Black girls. Our clocks swing heavy over our heads. Roots come up out the wrong end and whatnot. I am a perfect replica of the man from that marble ad. Here, give me your gun. Let me show you how I inhale it real easy. If you scroll through my timeline, 
You will find that I am very familiar with gaps and gats. I thrive despite your corridor of fire. That's reincarnation for you, baby. Every time you've tried to kill me, I've come back just a little thicker. Now here we are, officer. Don't you know my poems are the soft ticking under my father's pillow? A consequence of this having not loved me, his child, like a dream fulfilled. He don't know, I went to war with him. Smoked in Iraq's black sands with him. Our shared fatigue is as routine as the military's murder of oil-coated dreams that haunt me. I've camouflaged this fact with prescriptions. Officer, read from my cabinet shelf the names of the people whose faces hang on my father's wall, laminated in dust and security clearances. Like my father, I know what it means to be born flammable. Like my father, I'm a veteran now, condemned to the chair, chained to a desk, aiming my rifle out of my bedroom window and up the street to where you are making peace with your wife's petulance by pouring fists down her throat. It doesn't matter what her name is. Thanks to you, mine is the only one they will remember. This isn't news. I was always the language of lost time a percolating wound driving through some state or another dressed in gasoline, my sapphire glittering through my cheeks as I crossed every border in search of a resolution that could save me and save our families from your domestic terrorism. Perhaps I should have let the fighting continue. Perhaps I should have taught my child how to grind their teeth. Perhaps I should have gave you what you gave me threefold. Perhaps I should have made you get on your knees and beg for it. Perhaps. Perhaps, I believe now there isn't an easy way to suffocate pain. If I want the pain to end, I've got to get up to no good and goddamn well the art of rebellion. You don't lost your God-given mind talking to me and artillery. My brother is losing his children. My child is losing the feeling in her hands. The streets are being drained of their color. The streets are being banged out. The streets are being turned into battlefields by you. And now my body is humming with the memory of ticking against a paper ceiling. After all that glass, you about to be easy for me to chew on. Officer, I want you to take this the wrong way. This is the beginning of your end. We'll go round, come round and other shit like that. So no, I ain't got no goddamn ID. Thank you. Wow, that was incredible. I think everyone is, uh, is completely awestruck. That was amazing, Felita. Thank you so much um, for sharing that brand new work. Just amazing. Um, and I, I wanna remind everyone that Felita's program um, on November 30th, 5 p.m. Again, virtual event on Zoom. Um, if you want to hear more from Felita, you know, the RSVP is right there in the chat. Uh, you know, you know where to RSVP now. Um, thank you so much. Okay, all right. Well, we have one more uh, writer joining us tonight. Um, uh, another City of Asylum fellow, as it happens, and another neighbor of mine, and not just any neighbor, uh, the neighbor whose daughter is being babysat by my daughter right now, and I hope that she's doing a good job. Um, well, you'll debrief me after, um, but, but hopefully they haven't, they haven't bothered you too much. Um, I'd like everyone to welcome Ahmed Naji. Um, Ahmed is an Egyptian novelist and journalist born in Mansoura in 1985. He is the author of three books, Rogers, Seven Lessons Learned from Ahmed Maki and the Use of Life, as well as numerous blogs and other articles. He was also a journalist for Akbar al-Adab, a state-funded literary magazine, and frequently contributed to other newspapers and websites, including al Modan and Al-Masri al yum Naji has been a vocal critic of official corruption under the rule of Egyptian president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Um, everyone, welcome, Ahmed Naji. Hello, thank you all, and uh, thank you, Drew, for having me. Um, what I'm going to read today is an expert for my uh, last book, Rotten Evidence, Reading and Writing in Egyptian Prison. It was published in Arabic last year. We are in negotiation now with American publisher, hope the English translation will come out next year. Uh, the experts that I'm going to read was published also in the Believer magazine last issue uh, or February last issue. Uh, 
basically the text is depicting what I'm going to read is depicting uh, the trial of my case then going to, to, to the prison. And it goes like that. The public prosecutor quickly appealed the verdict. And the following months, we again found ourselves in court. I showed up with $2,000 in my pocket, enough to pay the fine I might get, just in case. The sentence wasn't announced immediately. Instead, my co-defendant, Tariq Tahir, and I were kept waiting in the courtroom until the day's hearing were finished. Finally, three police officers appeared and asked us to follow them. They laid us through a maze of back corridors crowded with courthouse staff and the prisoners to an office where a young lieutenant sat at butter desk with two other high ranking police commanders. The lieutenant read out the sentence, two years in prison for me and a fine for Tara. I burst out laughing and Tara launched into an enraged monologue about how important he was and how it must all be a mistake. Ignoring him, the eldest and the most senior of the three officers turned to me. What was the charge? He asked. I wrote a novel. What? And did you insult someone in the novel or accuse some general or politician of corruption? No. It's a literature, it's not about anyone real, it's kind of like science fiction. He pointed out finger at me, his other fingers glitching a ridzy string of prior bits. He said, listen, son, you are in the past to greatness now. I know that judge. He's tough one, God help us, and he makes some strange decision, but you will come out of this stranger. You have made a great man of yourself. Your name will go down in history. What, 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 I'm, what I'm meant to do with my greatness if I am in prison? I splittered, still laughing. Can't you keep the greatness and leave me to play in the mud? No box. Three days later, a senior police officer wearing a major e bullets flicked through the box in my bag. I was naked. I was naked except for boxers and surrounded by plain clothes detective and regular guards. This ritual marked my hand over from, from this ritual marked my hand my hand over from the police prison to prison. At the prison gate, I would be in order to strip for inspection in front of the welcome party. Then left to stand nearly naked while they signed paperwork and went through every scarf of fabric in my dutiful bag with no sense of urgency. Finally, someone handed me a pair of blue trousers and the blue shirts with a word, Nazil, prisoners, written on the back. The major, later I found out he was the prison chief of intelligence, baked two books out of my bag. Patrick Mudunu, the Internet, translated by Rene Haik, and al Bahar, Shahila and Hazakil, translated from Hebrew by Na'al al He shook his head and said, I can't let you bring this in. I can't let you bring this in unless they have been approved by, by the national security. They will have to be left in property. There is a library. You can use the box there. Then, he picked up the black leather notebook I used for shooting, for, for shooting down thoughts, journal entries, and sometimes notes of my, of my journalism. I know you are a writer and all of that, he said in conspiratorial whisper. So I will let you keep your journal and your pens. I managed muttered, oh, thank you. And among many other nervous stammering. I was, exhaust, I was exhausted. I was exhausted from three nights of sleeping on the tiled floor in the police station, from the three hour journey to the prison in the back of filthy metal van, from the tension, from the simultaneous hunger and lack of apathy, from the worry and fear, from the humiliation and the abuse, from finding myself thrust all of a sudden into a battle 
I hadn't to choose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, that was wonderful. And uh, I, I don't have the link in the window, but you can read an excerpt from that piece in the Believer magazine published last February. Oh, there it is. Perfect. Naila has it up for everyone. Um, so please check that out uh, when you have a chance. Um, that is the end of the reading segment. Thank you everyone so much from, for, for sharing your work. Um, I'm gonna invite everyone, all of the writers back onto the screen. Um, they can all reappear for us and we're going to answer some questions uh, from the audience. We have a few already in. Uh, if anyone else tuning in has any questions they'd like to ask, they can be specific, they can be general. Um, please send them our way and I will gladly convey them. Um, I'm going to start with a, an early question from Dave Gregory. It's a terrific one. It's for Mary. Um, he wanted to know, he, the, he said, the premise of your novel is one of the more unique ones I've heard in a long time. I agree with him. Uh, what drew you to this material and what was the genesis or germ for this novel? Oh, thanks so much for saying so. <laughs> That's really encouraging. Um, so I started thinking about this novel when I started like thinking about like plastics and um, like just how like when we go into the store, like the grocery store, the drugstore, anything, like all the things we buy are just so immediately disposable. And it just like made me frustrated and upset and as much as I did not change like my consumerist habits. And like, you know, I feel very powerless generally speaking in terms of like the environment. But um, I started to uh, read more about plastics. Um, like Roland Bart has like a great, um, article about plastics, even as back as far as the 50s, and he called it um, the first magical substance that contents itself with being prosaic. So I started thinking about it as like a sort of magical substance and how uh, like a sort of late capitalist metamorphosis would work. And I thought a lot of it wouldn't, wouldn't be into something sort of magical in the traditional sort of metamorphic sense, but it would be something into mundane like appliances or plastics or, you know, things we regard as disposable. Um, and that mirrored to me how we like, you know, treat people in certain uh, roles, like um, caretaking roles, like we, we expect so much of them. And um, we, you know, have a certain expectation of disposability of, of human beings, um, which is just wrong to me. So I thought this like metamorphosis mirrored that. So I wanted it to have be narrated from the point of view as a of a nurse. Um, at the same time, I thought like, you know, even the, the ultra wealthy are not exempt from this. So um, what would it look like? What would it look like for them to undergo such a process? And how could I comment on like sort of class and wealth inequality at the same time? So that's sort of where the origins of the idea came from. Fantastic. Thank you, Mary. Um, I have a question for Felita from Matrice McCure. Um, Matrice wanted to let you know that she really loved the second poem and that it gave great insight into what Black women experience when it comes to law enforcement. Matrice asked, what inspired you to write the poem? And they also wanted you to remind us the name of the poem. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Um, so the name of the poem is Officer, I Chew Bullets Like They Tobacco. Uh, a lot of my work that's happening right now is focused on misdemeanors and the escalation of misdemeanors. Um, the, um, the thesis being that black and brown bodies are policed, not just at the, uh, at the federal level, but on the everyday basis, just walking across the street, just standing in a parking lot, sitting in your car can escalate into death. And that's something that uh, I think most of the country kind of came to a realization of last summer, uh, but it's something that's been constant for people in my community uh, for our entire lives. I wanted to create something that is not only relatable, but also using the dialect of, you know, the people in my community and something that is keeping the same energy. Um, it's not just the book of poetry that I'm working on, but also my memoir in which I'm trying to talk about the progression of misdemeanors and how that has led to mass incarceration. Misdemeanors have been used as a tool to um, 
police black and brown bodies since slavery. And a lot of folks don't necessarily put those two things together. They go, you must have broken a law, which is why you're in handcuffs or why you're in a jail cell. Not necessarily that the government needed another way to keep um, black and brown folks from having access to housing or having access to healthcare. Uh, the link is kind of missing in people's minds. And so I'm hoping that the work will help to connect those links together. And also to kind of dispel some of the stereotypes that we all walk around with, that if people are using words um, that are, you know, I, I'm trying to put my mind together. I drove six hours <laughs> to Las Vegas tonight and I hopped on like 20 minutes before. Um, I wanted to say that just because someone is acting up in the streets doesn't necessarily mean that they don't know what's happening and that they're not aware of the repercussions of their actions. Um, and that sometimes it is very much just about protesting um, how their lifestyles and their opinions and their self has been policed. Um, and so I think that answered the question. <laughs> I think it definitely answered the question and does not seem like a six hour car ride question or answer, excuse me at all. Um, that was a great answer. Thank you so much. Um, I had uh, Sylvia Fox asked a very good question that was something I was going to ask if no one else did. Um, and Sylvia wants to know how you are organizing your time. What has surprised you about Vegas? And I'm going to, sorry, throw one more thing on there just to make it really loaded. Um, what do you guys find it challenging to, to uproot yourself and write in a new environment or is it actually creatively liberating or stimulating in some way? I guess you can answer any and all of, of those questions and anyone who wants to start, uh, anyone on the panel is welcome to jump in. I'll get us started. Um, it's extremely liberating. Uh, it's 360 degrees of mountain uh, and every night I get to kind of sit out and see the city at work, but also have the space to step back and be in silence. The space is actually very calming. One thing I really needed was light and there's a lot of light in the loft um, and then quick access to downtown. And so I've really loved being in this space. I definitely feel as though my mind kind of opened up. And so I've been getting a lot of work done. There are a lot more pages. I only shared two of them today, but there are a lot more pages I got done here. And it's only, uh, we're still only in the first couple of months. So I'm pretty excited about the rest of the time. I'm glad it's been productive so far. I always worry that like when people come, they're like, are they, are they producing work? Is, the, is are they gonna like accumulating? So it's, it's really good to hear. Um, does anyone else have any, uh, insight into any of this, uh, like what surprised them about Vegas or, or how, what the experience of writing on a fellowship has been like for them? Um, I feel very similarly to Felita that um, it's just been uh, such a beautiful place to be in. Um, like, I, I love the mountains here. Um, I've tried to balance um, ex like exploring and finding amazing things here with like writing and working. Um, and that's been really, actually nice to do. Um, like I went to um, a few weeks ago, like James Terrell's uh, ACOB like um, exhibit, which is like this sort of enclosure filled with this light, this chamber of light. Um, and it was behind a Prada store in like um, around all the like, um, not a Prada store, sorry, a Louis Vuitton store uh, surrounded by casinos. And it felt like this really special moment of discovering something really unique and beautiful inside like all the space that like um, you regard as like sort of, you know, what you traditionally think of Vegas in terms of like gambling and slot machines and everything. And I just feel like there's so many um, beautiful, beautiful natural things and really fun, um, interesting art things and cool things to discover about this space. And um, yeah, I've just been loving it here so much. Um, so once you get behind like what your pre preconceived notions of like gambling and everything like that is, there's just so much wonderful things here. And um, yeah, uh, it's been really great. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. You're all saying such great things about Vegas. <laughs> it makes me feel good about living here. Um, the city gets a bad rap sometimes. Not less, less now, less now, honestly. Um, we are coming close to the end. So if anyone else wants to jump on and uh, answer this question, otherwise I think perhaps we will um, move toward closing out this event. 
Yeah, I just want yeah. to comment as as a fellow, as a city of asylum fellow here uh, on this program, uh, especially. I think it's it's a great to 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 have this program in Las Vegas. Uh, I believe my experience in this program for the last two years have been perfect and perfect time, not only for for healing and prote- and and productivity. Talking about productivity, like I finished like three books until now, <laughs> and in addition to other project, and uh, I'm cooperating with a local filmmaker in Las Vegas. We are meeting, making a short documentary about living in Las Vegas. I believe without such a program, I wasn't able to 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 understand the American literature scene and culture uh, machine that is running the scene. Um, and to get such an opportunity to be neighbor with such wonderful writers and and poets, and it's like for me, it's like being in in literature uh, uh, Disneyland. It's like every three months, I I I read, I become neighbor with other amazing writer and poet, and discover a new space for writing through them, and I learn so much from them. Uh, so thank you very much, Beam, I uh, for for running such program, and please keep it working. Uh, such solidarity from uh, that you are providing here is vital for me, writer from all over the world. Uh, and for my dear neighbor, thank you for for being my neighbor, and we are waiting for you, Amanda, to come and have you all in our patio soon. I know I slipped in and out a couple of times without anybody seeing me, but um, I'm coming back actually very, very, very soon. Yeah, I ended up now every night I meet with Walter most of the time. <laughs> I know he's been there at different times. Smoking right? cigarette at night. Yeah, yeah. We we have oh, started to have a date for the night cigarette. The cigarettes. Well, I'm I'm I was going to say that um, my solution to Vegas when I first came was I just started writing about it. I was like, well, this is how I will, I will, you know, uh, integrate into this strange environment. And now you're never getting rid of me. Basically, I'm writing a book about Vegas, which I didn't mention, but I, um, I, it's just a little raw still. It's a little too early to even, you know, that where you're not sure what it is and you can't read from it yet. So that's, um, yeah. And it's a lot about my experience there in those early years that when I was first in Vegas five years ago when the shooting happened. So um, yeah, that's what I did is I just started covering a shooting. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's a wonderful place. And I'm so gratified to hear that Mary and Faelida are loving it so much. And um, Ahmed, I know you show, we share our um, just kind of devotion to the place because we've talked about it. Thank you all so much. I'm so, I'm so glad you all are having a good time here and it's been productive. Um, if Amanda will be uh, on a on an event next week with Claire Bay Watkins here in, in person. person in Vegas in person, um, yeah. and I encourage you to check out um, BMI's upcoming events. Join their mailing list. Go to their website. Um, find out what's coming. Buy a book bundle, if I may. <laughs> uh, encourage that. Uh, we will uh, drop a link again for you guys to to purchase one of those. Um, and I had one more thing I wanted to say that I'm just forgetting right now. Um, so I guess I'm going to, oh yes, there were a few questions we didn't get to. Um, and I would encourage you to reach out to the folks at Black Mountain Institute. Um, the fellows I'm sure are happy to answer your questions um, after the event uh, by email. Um, thank you so much everyone for attending uh, and have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you, Drew. Thank you.